What's ever up everybody? This is Professor Keegan um, and I'm here with another video lecture for our Tuesday night class this week. Uh, it's March 24th. Wow, time is going slowly in quarantine and I hope you're all doing okay and being safe. Um, I know that there's been a lot going on, a lot of disruption to all of our lives. Um, and so as I'm going to do for the rest of the semester, I'm going to begin this video lecture with some reminders. Um, just a quick mention too that if you haven't quite, uh, haven't quite added the Slack channel yet, I would encourage you to do that because that's an easy way to reach out to people in the course immediately, including myself. Um, and I, also sent you, I sent you all an invite link to Slack last week, so check your email for that. <clears throat> um, so um, just to get started, before we start tackling content, um, I wanted to push some reminders to you in my reminders slide. The first of which is that I'm, I'm highly aware that we have some remaining facilitation teams who haven't um, submitted their work yet. And I know that um, given the um, sort of chaos we're all dealing with, that these projects may have gotten a little delayed or you might be having trouble getting a hold of people. Um, so please do remember that that work is still work that will need to be completed um, in some form. I'm pretty flexible about how it gets done and when, but um, we are looking to produce some uh, student-led analysis of the material. Um, and so I would ask you all to contribute to your assigned project team as you are able. Um, uh, if you wanna just be very clear about what you can handle and what, where you're at, what kind of technology you have access to, um, that would be really helpful for us to be able to figure out a fair balance of work. Um, I am hearing that some people are trying to reach out to team members and are not getting responses. Um, so again, we are all gonna have to kind of be up on our communication more than we were in the past because we're not seeing each other physically anymore. So um, please check your email, please respond to messages from your team. Um, you know, it's stressful to not be able to get in touch with people. Um, if you're having a problem getting a hold of people, let me know and I can try to connect you. Um, also, let's make sure that workloads in these teams are fairly distributed. I am hearing that some people are not as available as others and that's creating some stress for folks. Um, I can certainly give um, advice about how to distribute workload or help you manage your team uh, uh, workflow. So just let me know about that. Um, and if you have any other trouble, uh, the best thing to do is just get a hold of me and let me know what's going on so I can try to put you in touch with other folks on your team. So far, things have been pretty smooth with this, but I do know that we're coming up on a few facilitations that are pretty far out from when we were all interrupted by um, this pandemic. So please just stay in touch and um, hopefully that will all get worked out in the next couple of weeks. Um, today, we're kind of transitioning um, through this uh, unit on bodies toward a unit called stories, and stories is our last class unit for the semester. Um, and we are beginning that unit, stories, with a highly visual text, um, Gaylord Phoenix, which is a graphic novel by illustrator Edith Bake. Um, and so what I'm going to do today um, is give you some uh, practice or exposure to um, techniques for reading images. And again, I think with visual material, people get really intimidated. They're like, I'm not an artist. I don't know how to interpret this stuff. And um, I would really say you do know how. You have grown up in a culture that uses uh, specific types of aesthetics to communicate value. And so we all kind of know how to approach images of bodies. Um, so I would say trust your gut. Um, get in touch with what's actually happening when you are looking at something um, rather than getting intimidated because um, what we're doing doesn't require formal training. Um, so unit five um, is going to take the skills we've built in this unit on bodies, interpreting images of non-normative embodiment, and we're going to add new considerations of narrative style and form. So kind of like what are the major organizational ways that stories are told? What kinds of stories are dominant in our culture? Um, what kinds of stories tend to organize the way we live our lives? And what kinds of stories are queer, trans, and intersex people kind of forced to tell about ourselves? Um, and then how do we resist that, right? Those are all kinds of questions we're gonna end the semester with. 
Um, so to get started, we are still kind of circling around um, this question of the body. And I had actually asked you to take a look at this painting by Riva Lehrer of Eli Clare um, last class. Uh, and we'll talk about your responses to that this image in a minute. Um, but first, I just want to quickly review some key ideas from Singer, which was assigned for today, uh, his article, Sublime Mutations. Um, right, I had gone over this last week, but he gives us an introduction to three ways of viewing bodies. Now, these are not the only ways to view bodies, but they're the ways that he is organizing uh, his own analysis in this essay. Um, and I think these are pretty instructive ways of thinking about what we're looking at in class. So remember, we covered the medical gaze, um, which is a type of gaze used in medicine and science that treats atypical bodies as objects um, rather than subjects, and also as examples of pathology or disease. And uh, this gaze does tend to dehumanize people and because it deprives them of social context and it deprives them of, of their own uniqueness. So it kind of treats the body as just an example of a problem. And we looked at a few examples of this gaze last week, and then we see Singer also discussing it. Um, I also had you read Repair and On-Site, uh, little snippets of uh, a book by uh, Hilary Malatino called Queer Embodiment. And uh, Malatino is an intersex re uh, researcher, and we see how they are affected in their own personal life by the way that they are looked at by medical providers. Um, we see the effects on them both as an intersex child and teen, and then later when Malatino um, becomes a researcher themselves, they go to the um, Kinsey archives in Indiana, and they, they're trying to find images of intersex people, and all they find are like these medicalized photos, right? So we see how this medical gaze can both have like structural effects on knowledge production, but also really deep emotional effects on people. Um, when they're treated like they're broken or, or diseased. Um, so that's the problem with that gaze. Then Singer also talks about the beautiful, um, which we discussed last week as well. And this is a gaze that emphasizes classical ideals, ideals of balance, unity, and integrity of form. Uh, we know it from looking at everything from Michelangelo's David to um, the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue, right? Like, we know what beautiful bodies look like, and we know what the standards for beauty are in our culture, because we're all held accountable to them um, in different ways. And the beautiful is a, is a problem for Singer because it reflects dominant ideals of gender, so it's a very kind of gender binary, cisgender kind of style of, of body, right? Um, it's able-bodied, it's healthy in a, a very specific kind of way. It's, you know, supposed to be slim and toned and white teeth uh, for white people, tan skin, right? All of these ways in which health is supposed to be communicated in certain aesthetic ways. Um, and lastly, also morality, right? A beautiful body is, is a body that's moral, a body that's made good decisions, a body that can police itself properly according to these standards. Um, so that's the beautiful. And then third is the sublime. And I feel like this this way of looking is something that people aren't as familiar with if you haven't engaged um, a wider range of, of aesthetic experiences, if you haven't maybe studied fine art or looked at experimental cinema. Um, Right, um, representations that exceed and or deconstruct dominant ideals and explore other ways in which bodies can be meaningful. Um, Singer introduces us to a number of people kind of making art with this kind of sublime effect um, in this piece. And we're going to then use that analysis to try to apply it to what Fake is doing in Gaylord Phoenix. So um, I'm going to actually talk you through a few instances of the sublime today in class, and then um, we'll work more with this concept next week. So that's just a quick refresher. Um, to go on, why is Singer so concerned about these ways of looking? Well, he's arguing that neither the medical gaze nor beauty are adequate, adequate ways of viewing transgender, intersex, or disabled bodies. You know, I think our uh, our initial response would be seeing that the medical gaze is bad and wanting to treat those bodies as if they're beautiful. And um, Singer disagrees with that model because he says that just replaces a new normative standard of able-bodiedness 
onto right where the medical gaze used to be. So neither way of looking is appropriate. It doesn't allow for diversity. Um, he says the medical gaze conceptualizes bodily differences as disease that must be corrected or cured. And so here we see again Claire's critique of cure logics coming in. Um, Singer is in agreement with that cure logics are oppressive. Um, but also the beautiful is not necessarily a solution to that, right? Because the beautiful is enforcing able-bodiedness, whiteness, cisgender standards for embodiment. And so the beautiful is kind of like the cured body that we want to produce out of disability or out of intersex or trans embodiment. Um, and the truth is that like intersex, trans, disabled people don't need to be fixed at all, shouldn't have to live up to the normative standards of beauty in our culture to be valued. And so um, these are kind of two sides of a coin, the medical gaze and the beautiful. So Singer argues, therefore, that we need an aesthetics of sublimity or the sublime through which to approach trans, intersex, and disabled bodies. We need to develop new ways of appreciating the diversity and infinite potential of the human body rather than trying to fix it, to make it all one way. Um, and so in this quote from the piece, he says, uh, it is my hope that by seizing the moment of the sublime, of sublime recognition of the limitless possible bodies, genders, and sexualities in trans worlds, and by confirming the potential terror of being faced with the great unknown, that a more ethical way to relate to trans people can emerge. So he's saying like, um, that the body actually has limitless possibilities um, and that that makes us scared, <laughs> right? And, and that's really at the root of a lot of like uh, violent beha behavior toward intersex trans and disabled people is this like fear of the body's plasticity, wanting the body to be predictable and easily categorized. And he says like that, we should pay attention to that response um, that terror. I'm sure maybe for some of us this discomfort came up while watching Sins and Valid, the same kind of like uneasy feeling about the the disabled body and, and its ability to do all the, all these interesting things, right? Um, that it makes us kind of fundamentally terrified about the integrity of our own bodies when we see that kind of complexity or plasticity. But Singer thinks it's crucial to finding a new way of treating people ethically. And in order to do this, he walks us through examples of transgender, intersex, and disabled self-portraiture. Um, so uh, to try to look at how these people have represented themselves in ways that push against the medical gaze um, and push us toward the sublime in different ways. So. Um, I had you look at Eli, Portrait of Eli by Riva Lehrer, and I actually was really impressed with your responses. I just wanted to walk you through a few things that people said um, in response to this piece. Uh, so someone said, um, here is Claire at the center of the photo. It's actually a painting, but it looks very photorealistic. Um, very hard to ignore. He isn't dwarfed by the beautiful imagery that surrounds him. Claire is sublime by depicting an emotional transformation that cannot be portrayed by realism, but through the natural symbolism shown in the painting. And again, right, um, I think what this person is getting at is that realism is this idea that we just reproduce things as though they're highly realistic. And that doesn't always get at some of the more complex, um, you know, potentials in experience. It doesn't allow us to maybe talk, think about, or portray Claire's relationship to nature in a way that feels true. Um, and so um, we see a sort of more fantastical or even psychedelic way of depicting that relationship. Um, someone else wrote, this portrait is anything but impersonal. We're watching Eli entangled with his identity, changed, seeing his complex beauty shining through. Now, yes, I would, I would say this is maybe a different take on beauty where beauty isn't simple and it's not easily understood or easily grasped. Right? It's a complex beauty, meaning a more sublime kind of form here. Uh, someone else wrote, this photo of Claire resists these typical representations by going against anonymity. So they're talking about um, how the black bars are put over the, the medical photos. We don't see that here. Uh, Claire's face is recognizable and there are no bars over his eyes. Therefore, his personhood is preserved and he can be seen as more than just a medicalized subject. Um, 
Claire's portrait falls in the category of sublime because it, quote, offers an encounter with the sublime which, unlike the beautiful, surpasses bounded meaning and remains resistant to easy interpretation, unquote. It's not meant to be looked at medically and it's not meant to be looked at sexually. So it falls into this category of sublime and it's something that you can look at numerous times and pull different interpretations and meanings out of. This portrait erases any boundaries that might have existed between Claire and the dynamic natural landscape. Ah, interesting. Um, resisting the ideals of beauty and instead giving the audience a sense of wonder and a taste of the sublime. Um, I like how this uh, person pointed out the lack of bounded meaning, right, uh, that we see in the above quote, where Claire and the natural world aren't separated. They're, they're not bounded. They don't have boundaries. And that can produce a kind of sublime effect. This portrait of Claire also shows the sublime by making the audience look at the art in a different way. Instead of saying, oh, obviously this painting shows that Claire was born in the wrong body, it makes you think deeper than that. You can see the transformation in this portrait, an example of the invisible inside turning into visible outside. Uh, that's a quote from Singer. Rather than normalizing disabled trans and intersex bodies, by viewing this portrait of Claire with an understanding of the beauty of non-normative bodies, we are able to move beyond cultural norms backed by medical journals and negative media representation, right? So remember, like the beautiful would be more in line with the normal and the medical gaze would be more in line with like stigma, right? And so the sublime is a third way through that binary. And lastly, someone wrote, the body is placed into a context that both draws attention to and away from its features. Claire's body in the portrait, as Singer would explain it, quote, challenges the pathologization by restaging and representing the ambivalence experiences by a person trapped not in a wrong body, but in the wrong cultural context. Uh, Claire's body, as emphasized in the metaphors within his book Exile and Pride, belongs among the trees and rivers. His body can be understood in reference to deforestation and uh, deforestation and harvest, destruction of the natural land and regrowth. Um, this is such a key point, right? Because remember, in the model of disability that Claire is working with, the social model argues that disability is caused by the built environment, not by the body. So here we see Claire is not in the wrong body. Um, in When he's in nature, he's not necessarily disabled. Um, he may have some impairments that affect him, but he's able to do almost everything he wants to do. It's, it's the context of the culture that creates most of his struggles. So we see him outside that social context and in the context of nature. Um, so great, um, great responses to this. And uh, I would say we should just lean harder into our own gut responses to the images we're looking at. Now, how would some of this commentary apply to some of the images Singer um, shows us in his piece? I just wanted to walk you through a few of these and talk a little bit about them. Um, so for example, this piece, um, which Singer gives us kind of in the middle of the article, um, which quotes the subject of the photo, Danny, asking, why are you always staring at my short arms from a collection called Completely Unperfect? And what we see here is a really um, interesting combination of traditional portraiture in which the female nude is um, often used as a central image, right? So we think about um, erotic photography of the female form is very, very common in Western culture the beautiful female form. But here we have the, the, the beauty and the sublimity of the image kind of crashing into each other, right? Because we have uh, able-bodied legs, very attractive able-bodied uh, legs. And then we have uh, Danny um, displaying her arms um, right next to those legs. And, and so we're confronted with the, 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 the reality of these two parts of herself being on, in one body. And also this is a um, photo that really resists the medical gaze because she's looking right at us so that she starts to kind of almost be challenging us to not look even as she then places her arms in the middle of the photo in a way where it's very hard not to, right? So we could think about how Claire talks about the legacy of the freak show and the flaunting of disability um, for the audience or the rube and how in this photo we kind of become rubes and Danny kind of challenges us 
um, to look away and knows that we cannot. And so, you know, we're kind of, instead of her being trapped by the way her disability is constructed, we become trapped as viewers by the way the photo is set up. And so this is, you could say, a way of kind of producing a kind of disability justice imagery where the able-bodied person is confronted with their privilege. Um, another image that Singer gives us is this image from Lauren Cameron, who's a transgender uh, photographer. This is a self-image called uh, God's Will, and we can see in the photo that Cameron is injecting himself with what appears to be probably testosterone, and he's also holding in his left hand the shutter stop for the camera. So we know that he is taking his own photo. And here what we see is that a very, very classical representation of male beauty. Um, Cameron's body conforms almost entirely to that Michelangelo's David um, golden ratio perfection of male form that we looked at last lecture. Um, but he does this with a twist. So this is beauty, but it's also self-constructed beauty, right? We know that he's achieved this beauty through non-conventional, non-quote natural means because um, he puts the needle in the photo, right? So he's not pretending to be cisgender. He's illustrating that cisgender beauty itself is um, easily kind of appropriated by other means and he he titles this god's will and he in the picture becomes god because he is the one making the choice to fashion himself this way so here we kind of see beauty deconstructed or like the naturalization of male beauty being deconstructed through technology and through um a kind of uh self-fashioning Another image uh, that Cameron makes at, that ends up in Singer's piece is called Jester. Now this is a really interesting image because it's directly referencing the history of the freak show. So we see, um, I don't know if you've ever been to a freak show or a circus where they have the different little like Conestoga wagons that have people inside, human oddities, and you can look through a little hole at like the bearded lady or the 400 pound man, right? Um, and so uh, Cameron actually puts himself inside one of these freak show boxes um, and he, he as a freak and he titles it Jester. Um, and we can see how here how he is again pushing against the medical or pathologizing gaze of, of the freak show and claiming agency over the relationship between the viewer and his own body by, by posing for the gaze. It's almost like he knows he can't that he can't control whether or not people are going to look at him as a freak, so he um, intentionally places himself in that role and displays himself like saying, "I know you want to look at me, so here you go." Um, and Singer actually includes a quote from Cameron about this picture, where Cameron says, "Every time I tell someone I'm transsexual, I have a turbulent series of emotions." At first, I'm afraid that whomever I'm telling will have a negative response, that they will somehow be repelled and become hostile or in some way reject me. But then, if I've been given a positive reception, I begin to spill it all with myopic enthusiasm, answering every question, which always encourages another. People are naturally curious, and some have a real need to know. By revealing myself, I have consensually invited their voyeurism. They can't help but watch as I make a spectacle of myself. In the end, when I have spilled my guts or exhausted their interest, I begin to retreat a little. A grayness falls over me, and I realize that I feel unsafe. I feel naked. Self-doubt starts to poke holes in my ego, and I begin to think I have exploited myself. I am ashamed of my exhibitionism. I promise myself not to tell anyone ever again. And so we can see here how whether, um, no matter who finds out, whether it's a negative or positive emotion or reaction that Cameron gets, there's always this problem of feeling that one is being objectified. And so how do you cope with that? Well, maybe you make art in which you objectify yourself um, before anyone else can. Um, and so this image too is very much in line with Claire's analysis of the freak show and its kind of complex history in that it allowed disabled and, and intersex people a way to con semi-control um, how people looked, but also did, it certainly wasn't 100% freeing either. 
A last image I wanted to talk about um, is this image. Well, it's a series of images by intersect photographer Della Lagr Lagrius Volcano called Mutating Self-Portrait. And um, Singer lists these separately, but they're actually a series. And in this series of photos, uh, Volcano is actually referencing medical photography, uh, putting that grid that would be used to measure the subject against a wall, uh, putting that behind him and then showing how many different versions of himself can exist. So here we see literally a mutating body or a permutating body where um, rather than being fixed in place by the, by the photo as a kind of example of pathology, uh, Volcano is showing that there is a huge multiplicity to his body and he can't be nailed down to any one of these categories because he is an intersex man. Um, and so <laughs> he doesn't fit just one category. He is many things at once. Um, I, I find this series really clever. So all that is to say that those are some ways of thinking about the way that people uh, represent bodies queerly or from a trans, intersex, or disabled perspective, right? And we're working with all those ideas in this unit. We're going to be applying them to a visual text, Gaylord Phoenix, right? This is the image from our syllabus. Um, I know us best when our borders fly open. What does it mean for the borders of the body to fly open? What And what's going on once that, once that happens? Um, what kinds of new meaning become possible? Uh, what kinds of new connections and stories? So we're gonna be taking all of these considerations into a kind of fantasy story uh, of self-discovery um, and uh, Gaylord Phoenix is like this story of, of inner journeys um, to find out who we really are. Um, so what I'll have you do is travel back to discussions to respond to the content in this lecture. And then uh, next week we will begin with uh, Gaylord Phoenix and we'll talk about what we're seeing in that book. Okay, so uh, that's all for now. And uh, thank you very much and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.